Hello and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Cora Kozet, I'm a Community Manager at eLife and I will be facilitating this call. Uh, Naomi Penfold, eLife Innovation Officer, is uh, here with me. Uh, it's our second call where presenters is working on software projects for the benefit of the research community, volunteer on the agenda to update the community on their progress and invite feedback and support from others. We hope the call, as much as uh, an overview of current initiatives, will also serve as an opportunity to, uh, to start new conversations and hopefully collaborations. Thanks again to everyone who's put themselves uh, forward to talk on the agenda. Let me now explain how it will all work. Please refer to the open agenda throughout this call. Uh, please sign in uh, there under line 23. Uh, and put your name in the box in the top right hand corner. Um, you can pick a color if you want to. Uh, but this way we will be able to attribute your comments and questions to you and others might be able to continue conversations with you after the call. You can introduce yourself and say hello and share your thoughts during the call in the chat field on the right hand side of the agenda. During the presentations, you can type your comments and questions uh, as we go under each and any of the initiatives being presented today in the space provided. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to take notes about initiatives that are being discussed. Uh, there is space provided for that too. Uh, I would be very grateful to anyone who's inclined to do this. Uh, please let us know in the agenda, uh, in the agen uh, agenda chat box um, if, you're, if you're keen to do that. Uh, if you want to share a project and didn't get a chance, please add yourself to the bottom of the document uh, for future calls uh, and uh, or you might want to also share a non-verbal update here today. If any of this is unclear, use the chat box on your right-hand side to let us know. After each presentation, we'll have a couple of minutes for discussion. Please use the raise your hand button on the right-hand side control uh, panel of, your, of the GoToMeeting webinar to indicate if you'd like to speak. We will be able to unmute you during the time for questions after each presentation. Please note, we're unlikely to be able to have the time for all questions, so don't hesitate to write them on the agenda for the presenter to answer, answer directly. Now to the speakers. We'll ask every speaker uh, in their brief five minutes to introduce themselves and present their work. We allow uh, up to two minutes for questions after each presentation. Uh, please forgive us for uh, being very strict with the timekeeping, but we have a lot to get through. Now, uh, we're going to... Um, Give the floor to Daniela Lewenberg on Dryad CDL partnership. Hi, Daniela, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Now we can hear you as well. Great. Um, and I'm, I share the screen now? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to invite you to share your screen in a second. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can see that fine. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm not going to put it in presenter mode because it might have some issues, but Hello, I am Daniela Lowenberg. I'm a product manager for data publishing at the California Digital Library. Uh, I also am the project lead for Make Data Count, another open project. Um, and today I wanna to talk about um, the partnership between California Digital Library and Dryad Digital Repository uh, that I'm hoping a lot of people have seen, but I also see in the notes here, there are some links to our announcements. So, um, Dryad and CDL are partnering um, because we want to drive adoption of data publishing in a new and innovative way. And I want to go over kind of what we're visioning with this um, at a very high level. So currently uh, in the researcher landscape, a researcher submits an article and they have a whole bunch of options. And then they go to submit their data if they need to or have to or want to. Um, and they have a lot of choices. And there's a lot of competition and it's getting quite confusing. There's a lot of institutional repositories, there's general open repositories, um, commercial repositories, and of course, domain. And what we're kind of seeing is that commercial repositories are um, really getting lots of adoption while the institutional repositories um, really aren't being focused on. And that's because researchers just don't think at the institutional level. Um, and so taking that into consideration, we were trying to think of how can we actually make this work? And so what we see as the future with this partnership uh, is that we really need to build data publication into the research ecosystem. And we need to do that because 
two reasons. We need to make data publishing a normal practice, and we also know that different stakeholders in the research process value very different things. Data librarians and institutions may focus on curation, and article publishers may focus on peer review of data, but those two things are really different, and everyone has different resources in this. And so what we want to do is meet researchers at their workflows and actually integrate directly into the article publishing world um, so that when researchers are depositing or submitting their articles, they can simultaneously publish their data and they may not even know it's going out because it's integrated into the article system. But beyond that, we want to get institutions involved. A lot of institutions are spending resources on building out these repositories for data. But if researchers already know the Dryad name and they're already submitting there and it's integrated with the articles, we think it would be really great if we could send those copies back to institutional repositories, connect the data librarians in to work on curation, and kind of get this ecosystem going where journal publishing, data publishing, and institutions are all working together in a space that researchers are already familiar with. But beyond that, we want to think beyond the article. We know that this doesn't just mean connecting to article publishing, but looking beyond to preprints, electronic lab notebooks like Jupyter, micro publications, and kind of get this ecosystem running in all ways that research outputs are going right now. And that means including software and really all other parts of the system. Um, and that way, data publishing maybe can become a more normal practice that researchers are accustomed to. Um, but still in a way that's, you know, talking about curation and having institutions involved and, and in that sense. So at a high level, what our goals for this project are, are to integrate into research workflows, leverage institutional knowledge and institutional resources, and drive adoption of curated and fair data publishing. Um, the team is just initiating now we're getting together our roadmap we will share everything open all code and all of our roadmaps will be public in our new github that is a combined effort from cdl and dryad um, and we really hope to be engaging the community a lot in this you will see many invitations soon for workshops that we will be putting on uh, where we really want to get all community input while we're building this um, so that it can be a really community-led project any questions? Hi, Daniela. I'm looking for um, raised hands right now. We have one question here. Um, so, Michael uh, Barsinai, I'm sorry if I mispronunciated your name. Uh, I'm going to unmute you now so you can ask uh, Daniela directly. Hi, Michael. Okay, hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, perfect pronunciation, by the way. Very good. Um, so I was I'm as part of the Force 11 decision trees. We're uh, we're implementing a uh, repository selection decision tree. So it's like an interactive interview uh, with the UCSD actually. So I wonder if this is something that that could we could collaborate on, or are you aware of this uh, effort from UCSD? Um, yeah, I know a bit about it um, because we work with UCSD, but I think it would be really great if we could connect about this. I think that's a really great idea. Okay, great. So we'll continue this after. Perfect. Uh, right, there is uh, more questions uh, directly on the agenda. So someone is asking, uh, Daniela, uh, how do you plan to incentivize researchers to make use of the Dryad uh, and IR? That's a good question. Um, I, if you're asking about, you know, the image where we're kind of showing that it's integrated with IR, um, we actually probably wouldn't focus on the researcher ever really knowing that that's happening in the back with the IR. It would really be that we're just incentivizing researchers to be depositing either directly to Dryad or through publishing or through Jupyter Notebooks. And in the background, it's actually just still sending a copy for preservation to their local institution IR. Right, thank you. Uh, and I think now we will uh, switch to our next presenter. Uh, uh, Paul Shannon from Eli will talk about uh, Eli's Libero. Right, you're all ready? Okay, yep. Um, right, press present.
Excellent. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, an update for Libra. We talked about this on the last open source course, so I'm not going to go into too much detail um, about the application itself, just more where we've got to and where, where we're going and how we'd like other people to um, get involved. So uh, just first of all, a very quick refresher. So um, I'm Paul. I'm the head of technology here at Eli. Our team have been working on um, Libra, which is an evolution of the platform that powers eLife, the journal. Um, uh, so Libra is our open source platform of services and applications to help publishers do more with everything they publish. It's all completely open source and the MIT license um, and built by the community. With, with Libra, we made a specific effort to be more community driven, which is why we, we like input from other people. Um, so to start with, uh, we've been trying to tr uh, look at the way that the architecture needs to evolve so that we can be uh, more open and easier for other people to get involved um, in the platform rather than just the eLab the e team, which is uh, how our software has been working so far. Uh, and from that, we've arrived at a slightly different architecture that's looking um, a bit like this. Uh, so uh, everything is uh, driven through an, an API, so uh, the adding of uh, new content, whether that be articles or blog posts or uh, other parts um, to your publishing platform uh, are created through this this uh, gateway. Um, and then there's an automated and quite visible uh, flow in the background that, that takes your articles and moves it around um, the platform, if you like, moving images to things like the asset store, um, transforming the, the data, putting that in a, a more accessible place and so on. And every time something happens um, in this workflow, um, there's a dashboard will show you everything that's going on. So you can have um, people in your production teams and so on uh, checking what's happening in the system. It all, all links together with this event bus, which is at the bottom. Um, and that is one of the key things that we've added, um, which makes it really simple to integrate any other part of any other system into it. It all uses, uh, as you can see here, standard HTTP um, uh, communication, which is a standard for most other systems. So anything that you've heard of that has an API could connect into this. Um, so you can easily migrate content to and from it. Um, and you can even uh, link in other systems or, or build new parts. It, it also makes the architecture much easier for us to uh, build new sections too. So you can see something like a, a search or recommendation engine could be hooked in there quite nice and easily. Um, so we've built what we call our walking skeleton, basically a, a, a working prototype without any meat on the bones. Um, so here you can see pretty basic uh, our article. Um, it shows you can add images in different languages and so on. Um, and then here, a uh, quick change there, you can see the same article but in Spanish. This is one of the fundamental changes that we've made into the system um, since uh, evolving it from what uh, is, is currently powering eLife. And you can see here how we've done that through uh, having different uh, name, uh, namespaces within the API responses on, on the XML, which is a, a new thing for the system. And you can see there the front matter is available in different languages. Um, and then if you want to expand it even further, you can see in this example that we've included a, a whole eLife extension to this um, uh, and also a MathML extension so that in this XML response, we can add a Eli specific tag, which is our digest there, or further down in this file, you would have seen some MathML. This is addressing the problem that although there's some good standards in the uh, publishing sector, that not everyone uses them exactly the same way, and people want to be able to add and, and compose things in, in different ways. Um, so rather than trying to take one publishes XML and shoehorn it into one format, this allows you to be a lot more flexible um, up and down the stack. So we really need to test this out, um, so it'd be great to get any feedback on what we've done. Um, and this is a, just a quick shot of the, the dashboard. Again, all the uh, events that happen in the system are easily viewable, so you can easily see what's going on. Um, and then <laughs> all the jobs that are running using a, another open source tool called Apache Airflow, developed by Airbnb a few years ago. And you can see there all the different jobs that are happening all nicely listed out. You can see the time they took and how, where they fit on the timeline. Um, and then you can see all the various status of each of the jobs. So you get a lot more um, a lot more data, a lot more insight into how your publishing system works. So if you'd like to get involved, um, tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. British summer time, uh, we are running a quick demo call. We'll be running through this in more detail. Um, the, uh, the link to this slide deck is in the, the notes, so you can go and find those links later. So please come and join that. Um, if you can, we'll be recording it and be tweeting about it later, so um, no worries if it's too early for you. Um, and we'll also be running a 
uh, development sprint later uh, in the year, um, starting with a two-day workshop in Cambridge. So anyone who wants to get involved um, can join that or at least follow on on the GitHub repos. And anything that you need to know about uh, code or the community is available on libro.pub. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, some questions for you here as well. So first of all, uh, Jody Schneider uh, would like to like, ask a question. Uh, Jody, I'm going to unmute you now, and you'll be able to speak with um, Paul directly. Uh, no, I must have pushed the wrong button. Sorry. <laughs> all right, uh, no worries. Right, since I cannot see any more questions uh, straight away, uh, so um, let's uh, uh, move on swiftly to the next person, and I would like to invite uh, Adi to tell us about Professor. Hello, can I? Uh, can, hello. Yeah, yeah, can we can hear can now. Every, yeah, sorry, I just lost for a minute. Yeah. So yeah, hi, uh, I'm Adi. I'm calling from India, and I'm founder of Professor from India. And we were trying to uh, address reproducibility challenge that, that we have in science uh, by enabling and capturing reuse. So there are challenges that we have in reproducibility. People say that this is not reproducible, this is not reproducible, but they never say how actually they try to reuse or reproduce something. So that's what we are trying to do. So if we look at briefly, so uh, I hope everyone is able to see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is what we happen uh, happens like uh, authors, researchers used to publish their papers, data, and then we wait for views, downloads, and someone to cite it. But in the event authors don't publish uh, their additional research outputs like the detailed protocols, uh, data sets, code, and they do they didn't even uh, find a reason why they need to share these things. And there are so many uh, missing reuse instances like people say can't reproduce even though I have data. What's missing? Uh, maybe I, I need to have something uh, to which I can properly reuse this or reproduce this particular experiment. So what we are trying to do is uh, we were trying to introduce a reuse recipe document between the published article and the data, which would be evolving unlike uh, the one time events like published article or even data publishing. And this reuse recipe document basically enables authors and the people who are trying to reuse to interact with each other so that this can evolve and help in aiding the reusability of, of the, both the research article as well as the data. So let me go through a brief demo how this reuse recipe document looks. So this is potentially a journal article and people can click on this link to uh, see the reuse recipe document on uh, which actually guides people how to reuse or reproduce any experiment or methods in these particular steps. So uh, this, uh, so this uh, reuse recipe document is dynamic. You can see people can import uh, their code from GitHub and people can import their data published on Figshare and also they can import their protocols published on protocols.io. So this is completely interoperable. Like uh, this is a place where they can aggregate all their segregated uh, additional research outputs like protocols, data, code, which are there on different platforms into a single document so that this would help reusers to see all the content that's needed for uh, for easy reusing a particular research. But uh, this, we are not ending here. So you can see a small button here, uh, get credit for reuse. So this is a place where a reuser can potentially say how uh, able to reproduce or reusing protocols for your own research. So uh, they can say yes or no. So uh, let's start. Uh, so when they say yes, we'll ask them what's the experiment that you try to reproduce. They can say continue. And we ask them, have you made any changes to experimental steps? as uh, so they can uh, tell the changes that they have made so basically this is a place where we collect uh, how people are actually using uh, uh, others research so if you start with no uh, i'll show you And these feedbacks are basically sent to authors so that they can make uh, changes to this re recipe document. As I said, unlike uh, other documents, we, we version this reuse recipe document. So every change that's been recorded in the document is versioned and stored. So I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so uh, this is how author and reuser interactions work. So let's say a reuser uploads a successful reuse instance, it gets published. 
and let's say if he says i couldn't reproduce a particular experiment because i feel that a protocol is missing or some data description is missing and we send these negative feedbacks exclusively to the author so that he can come back and make changes to this reuse recipe document uh, and also uh, the kind of reuse instances that uh, reuser contributions uh, can do is we can capture the kind of alterations people are doing uh, during this successful or unsuccessful uh, events uh, like you can you can get to capture what are the alternate procedures or steps people have implemented in order to, in order to reproduce or reuse a particular experiment or not and we can also capture how people are troubleshooting in case things are not easily reproducible so we are trying to actually crowdsource the reproducibility issue by enabling author and reusers interact with each other uh, and i can uh, quickly show you how a reu uh, uh, reuse instance could look like so uh, this is a form uh, this is a published successful reuse instance where uh, he says yes he is able to reproduce he didn't made any changes but he had some insight to share uh, like he made the same covariance analysis in rodents uh, and uh, th so this is how and you can also see uh, a note from author upon publishing this successful reuse instance where he just says thanks your go uh, results are good and establishing the covariance analysis use case in rodents and this is also a place where uh, people can also explore uh, good partnership uh, collaboration opportunities and one thing that uh, inspired us to build this is uh, this is a line that we picked up from the manifest of reproducible science where uh, marcus says that uh, there should be a place where we can pursue self examination and continuously improve and self correct the scientific process itself and we believe that uh, because of this dynamic and evolving nature of reuse recipe document Uh, this would help uh, address uh, some of the reproducibility challenges at least some of them uh, yeah uh, so i'm done with my presentation and i'm open to questions um uh, thank you adi uh, very good time keeping as well uh, so um at the moment i cannot see any questions uh in uh, either the agenda or um any raised hands in in the um go to meeting panel so We shall okay. move on to the next speaker. That is not to say that someone is not going to. Oh, somebody is typing a question right now as we speak. Uh, so um, let me just uh, read it out when it appears. Oh, how would it be linked to the article and uh, or data? Um, I suppose the record in your in your application. Could you um, tell us more about that? Yeah. So we have APIs uh, through which we can integrate the, uh, this to editorial manager or scholar one. so it basically works like as soon as someone submits a manuscript an automated invitation link will be sent to author to create this reuse recipe document and we link this reuse recipe document to the published article through widgets and badges so there are open apis available for publishers to integrate to their main article right um thank you uh thank you very much adi uh, so now uh, we are going to yeah. move on to the next speaker who is uh Jason Priam uh, uh who will tell us about unpayable. Great, thanks very much. And uh I'm sharing my screen. It looks like y'all can see that. Is that right? Yes. All right, fantastic. Well, my name is Jason Priam uh and I am a co-founder of Unpayable, uh of Impact Story and we made a thing called Unpayable. And Impact Story is a non-profit organization um that's excited about making tools to help power open science. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Unpaywall and um and invite people to use it. It's a free and open source tool. Um it's an open database of 18 million free scholarly articles. Um you can think of it as sort of a legal sci-hub. So like sci-hub has got a collection of tons of scholarly articles that you can use for free. We're the same thing, but ours instead of being pirated is coming from publishers and from scholars and from institutional repositories. So we're harvesting over 5,000 repositories, we're harvesting like yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's similar to I have a legal and we get the information from institutional repositories and from publishers. And we have as I said 18 million free open scholarly articles. So we've got a lot of folks using this database already and you guys can probably see that list of some of the people there we're really excited to be in use by a lot of funders um and by a lot of tools that you may be using already one of the uses that we think is really cool is a um is a extension 
which is right here. And so this is a Chrome extension that you can add to your Chrome browser. It's totally free again. And uh, we've got, as you can see, a fair number of users on it already, which we're really happy about. Um, and the way that works is when you go visit an article, like here's a nature article, it's pretty cool. It's about people finding terrestrial planets like Earth around a nearby star, which is pretty neat. So I bet a lot of people would find that interesting. But of course, the bummer is that when you go down to read it, oh, snap, like that's pretty expensive, right? People don't really want to pay that money. So that's where we come in. We've done an API call in the background to our database of free articles. We've got this little tab. And if you click on the tab, you can see that you will go to archive up here. And it's going to take a minute to download because it's quite a long paper. But we can now read the PDF for free on archive. So again, this is totally legal because this was uploaded by the authors in um, accordance with the copyright agreement they signed with the publisher with Nature in this case. So that's pretty cool. So this is an API call in the background. Um, as you can see, we find the best OA location. And not only are we finding a URL for it, but we're also checking to see the license. On this particular one, we weren't able to find a license. But most of the time, we're able to find a license. Um, and if there's multiple locations, we're able to find those too. Um, we also find the authors and a bunch of metadata and stuff like that. So there's a number of ways you can get access to this. One of them is via this very cool tool from uh, not by us, but Nice Yan, which I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but it's pretty awesome. And it's uh, uh, an R wrapper around our API. Um, another way you can get access to it is by reading research about it. So this is a paper that we wrote about the data set. And we can see in this image that this is the uh, total number um, on the left here. This is the total number of articles published. The gray ones are total access in our data set. And the different colors are other kinds of access. So that's total on the left. The proportion on the right, I think, is pretty interesting. And unsurprisingly, from 1950 to 1990, the proportion stayed pretty similar. But starting in uh, the late 90s, uh, we were able to see a real growth in open access, uh, in particular in gold open access. And I think that's, uh, that's I think, something that we're excited about. Um, as big open access advocates, we love seeing that a growing percentage of the literature is open. As you can see, it's about 50, nearly 50%. And in fact, in our logs, we're able to find that about half the time people uh, are able to find an open access article with our service. Um, you can also download the entire snapshot. So that's uh, where did I? Here it is. So if you just go up here to products, there's a lot of other ways you can get at it. So you can get the database snapshot. Um, we also have a database feed that you can get so that every week you can get updates. There's 95 million articles in the database, um, but about a million of them change every week. So either open access appears or disappears, something like that. And so you can get that and even sync a copy of the database. So that's kind of the gist of it. And uh, I'd love to hear any questions you guys have. Uh, right. Uh, 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 thank you, Jason. Uh, so um, we've got uh, a question appearing uh, at the moment uh, on the agenda. If a person, oh yes, someone has raised their hands. Hopefully, uh, they'll be able to ask ask the question directly. Uh, Joe, uh, Wells, uh, I'm going to unmute you now so we can ask a question. Hi there. Um, this is. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me, okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Cool. Sorry. Uh, hi. This is this is Joe from um, Crossref. Um, you were presenting uh, at um, the last Thought Metrics conference. The um, usage of um, paywall um, and, and showing it in um, correlating it against other things um, are you still uh, are you still tracking usage and uh, what are you doing with that data and I suppose I'm also interested because you mentioned it earlier you're true you're tracking to people you know meet with success and uh, there's the inevitable boring question about GDPR as well um, apologies for that but I'm kind of curious about what you're doing with your with your logs Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. And um, there's a number of different ways that people can get into the system. And we know different things about them depending on the way they got in. So for instance, the API is being used by about 1,500, so about uh, probably 1,700 libraries worldwide. So the um, University of California system is using it, the British library is using it, a lot of German libraries using it. And in all those cases, we get an API call, but we don't really get anything else. So in terms of GCPR and privacy, we don't really know anything about the identity of the people doing the call. And that's true for most of the of the uses we have. The extension, for instance, there's no sign in. So we don't know anyone's email or anything about their identity. 
Um, what we do know is, as you said, uh, we know the general, like, so the country that the call came from uh, because the IP address. And we also know, as you said, how likely we are to, uh, to successfully find an open resource. Uh, we find open, uh, open access materials about 40%, 47% of the time. Um, and uh, in terms of countries, the top countries are perhaps unsurprisingly the US and the UK. Uh, we also see a lot of use from China. Right. Um, I'm afraid uh, I need to stop you there, Jason. Uh, this is fascinating, and I can see that more and more questions are appearing on the agenda, but I'm afraid um, those will have to be taken up in writing. I hope you'll be able to respond to, to those people who are interested uh, in, in your project more. And now um, we have to switch to uh, Evo Jimenez. So, um, would, we, would you be able to... Uh, uh, can you now speak? Hello. Um, um, yeah. We can thank hear you now. for the opportunity to present. Yes, uh, this is the this is a brief introduction to Popper, the an experimentation protocol we've been working um, uh, with funding from many folks. And uh, this is going to be a quick intro and a demo. Hopefully, I have time for the demo. But the idea is we want to address the a very practical problem that we face when, we're, when we do computational or data science, which is uh, reading a paper and finding questions that are of practical nature but are not answer, necessarily answered by reading the paper and very, very uh, uh, straightforward things like how was something installed, how was a particular uh, tool invoked, which flags are passed, where are the files, which paths, and things like that. So the idea is, to kind of like abstract a little bit on experimentation pipelines and realize that almost all of us that are doing some sort of computational or data science follow this high level pipeline. And throughout these uh, different stages of the pipeline, we, uh, we, we uh, carry out tasks like writing code, managing code, managing data sets, uh, writing documentation and so on and so forth. And if we compare this, this, uh, these tasks with what people do in software in software engineering, we see that there's almost like a lot of one-to-one -one mapping to category of tools, which people refer to in industry and in software uh, development communities as the both tools. So the idea behind Popper is why don't we make use and leverage those in order to make it easier to repeat and reproduce what uh, what someone, one original author has done, given that these communities are solving that problem, the problem of software reproducibility. We want to leverage that and apply it to a academic context and, and for doing scholarly communication. So the public convention is very simple. We, we, we just pick tools in this tool set, write scripts for those, and put it on GitHub or on somewhere else. And in order to make it easier, we have a CLI tool that, uh, that allows users to follow the convention. And I'm gonna try to show a demo right now. So the idea is um, you're working as if you were working on, on, a, on a software project. You initialize a repo for your paper, and then you quote unquote, popperize it. And the idea is that uh, we can either search for things that are that are that have been published by someone else. For example, I'm here I'm trying to search for some pipeline that might be dealing with CO2 uh, emissions of of some kind, and my network is really slow. But this is going to GitHub and 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 looking at the uh, the pipelines that have been pushed by other people. And then I found that there's one here, so I'm gonna add it, because I wanna rerun it. So I'm gonna download the code, and I didn't show you, but the the the, the repo was empty, right? Because I just created it. But now I have this uh, new pipeline, and Popper allows you to visualize the stages of a pipeline. Uh, just to see what people did. So in this pipeline, people 
set up things, then run, and then validate. And you can actually run because we know what are the stages of a pipeline. We can run it. And, and if, if the original authors are taking care of making their pipeline supportable, either by using Docker or virtual environments or virtual machines or any source of portability tool, this allows us to easily rerun and obtain the same results. And, and if you're also codifying validations, you can also verify that the results are the same or the, or, or the, the, the claims that the original art tool make, you are validating those. And something we are working over the summer in the context of the Google Summer Code is uh, this um, new future where we're going to uh, integrate with uh, DOI services. So, uh, so far we have support for Senado and Fixture, and this allows you to do, uh, you, you create an account on Senado, you get your token, and then you do proper uh, archive and then service Senado. And then you run it and you will get your, this is going to archive your repo, you're gonna get a DOI, and you're gonna be able to share that with others. Uh, we also have many other features. We are happy to um, help. We have a Gitter channel um, where we answer any questions that people might have. And we are working with scientists from many domains. Many domains, we wanna make this as domain agnostic as, as possible. Um, that's it. Um, any questions? Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivo. Um, so now there is a, there is time for questions. So if anyone has a question for Ivo, uh, please uh, be brave and write it in uh, on the agenda, or um, uh, you can also uh, raise your hand. Um, right. As I'm not seeing any questions coming in, uh, if uh, if that's all right uh, with you, Ivo, then uh, we shall uh, move on to the next speaker, uh, Aki McFarlane uh, from uh, the Wellcome Trust, who will tell us about uh, the uh, Open Research Fund. Hi there. Thank you very much. I think hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, and I'm here from the Wellcome Trust, uh, which if anyone isn't aware, is a funder of health research. Uh, I am a program officer for Open Research, so that's why I'm here on this call, and I'm here to advertise our new funding scheme to you, which is called the Open Research Fund. It is, it is open now for applications until Tuesday the 7th of August. And the broad ambition you can see here uh, on our screen is to support approaches, resources, and tools at the cutting edge of open research, um, which downstream will help us in our team's goal of ensuring that research outputs are discovered, accessed, and reused to maximize uh, the benefit to health. Eligibility-wise, um, obviously we have uh, a very strong focus on health here at Welcome. And so we want to be sure that any applications are benefiting health research. But we recognize that um, innovations in the research system can come from outside of the health research um, disciplines. And so we are open to applicants from pretty much any discipline, but we would uh, caution applicants to be sure that there is a relevance to health research and that you can show uh, your proposal would be relevant to health research. Uh, as for seniority, I would say we're looking for ideas and applicants who are ideally placed to carry out those ideas. So we don't have a particular seniority level in mind. Uh, and there's a few more details on here, including the kinds of uh, organizations you can be based at. You can find this information on our website in the links I can see are in the uh, channel there. So I will just move on in the interest of time. So 
I should say, as well, each award is up to £50,000 for a duration of up to one year. So we are envisaging a small self-contained project, but that might be implementing a new tool, or it might be adding a new piece of functionality to a large uh, existing service, for example. Uh, and we are accepting applications once per year. As I said, uh, the next deadline is 7th of August. And we are trying out something a bit different here with just this one scheme only at Welcome is we're going to be a little bit more transparent than we usually are. Uh, and we are hoping to make more details than we usually do uh, of the proposals available on our website. And this will be for both successful and unsuccessful applications. The idea being we want people to see uh, what everyone is thinking, what ideas people have, and hopefully spark some collaboration through that. And, and at the same time, hopefully uh, allow future applicants to see what kind of applications were suitable for our scheme versus those which weren't. And that will be done through us sharing a short summary of why the proposal or not. This will be very high level uh, and won't uh, delve into too much detail uh, of the applications. And again, this will only apply to this scheme. And it's a bit of an experiment, I will say. If, if it doesn't go down very well, maybe we won't do that again in future. But who can say? And just a really brief summary of what we think a successful proposal will do. As I said, we're wanting applicants to suggest ideas for innovative tools, resources, or ways of working. So this might be something like the way that you use an open lab notebook, or this might be some of the tools like you uh, have been mentioning so far on the call. Um, but the really key thing is that we want to see people evaluate quite strongly the impact, benefits and risks of the approach that they have suggested, because we do recognize that uh, doing research openly does not come without its risks. And we would really like people to uh, confront this and discuss this. And we think, really think that um, conversation is key to changing hearts and minds of uh, those people who probably aren't on this call who don't believe that open is um, beneficial. Uh, and we welcome proposals um, across international borders, between sectors and disciplines, although you don't have to. Uh, and I'm conscious here that, that I've mentioned um, data, code, and other research outputs, but I would like to say that, that we do consider things like protocols, pipelines, anything that is generated through the course of research, research output. And I think you could also argue that supporting other aspects of the research ecosystem to be more open would contribute towards um, the access and reuse of research outputs. So interpret this remit uh, quite broadly is what I would say. And if you're concerned about remit, then get in touch with us uh, and we can hopefully help you out. I have here a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through these because I'm conscious I'm running very close to time. Um, and you can contact us on our uh, email address that's written here, or you can find my email address on the Welcome website should you wish to do so. Uh, and otherwise, I'll open up to some questions. Right. Uh, great. Thank you, Aki, uh, for the presentation. Uh, we have a very short space of time for questions. Uh, so I just wanted to check. There is nothing written in as yet. Uh, and in terms of questions coming, uh, I've got one question for you. Um, can you just tell us uh, what stage of development does the application need to be to be considered for this? Uh, sure. I think we're fairly flexible on that, recognizing that there's a quite a short time in which to put the application in. It, it might be the germ of an idea, uh, or it might be something that I said already exists and you want to add new functionality to. It might be something that's part way through. Um, I guess my guidance would be to be aware that the grant will only last for one year, and you need to have something at the end of that 
to be evaluated. So it will depend, I think, on the scale of the project at what stage it needs to be before submission. Uh, excellent. Um, thank you, Aki. Uh, so um, we'll now uh, move uh, on swiftly to the next speaker. Uh, and I would like to invite Anthony uh, Gitter from the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, to tell us about ManuBot. Hello. I believe I'm mic'd up and we'll share my screen now. Yep, we can see it. Thanks. Great. So I have a link to the slides that I'll be sharing today. Uh, these come courtesy of one of the ManuBot co-leads, Daniel Himmelstein and Casey Green, who are my main collaborators from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so ManuBot is a manuscript authoring system that aims to automate parts of the manuscript writing process. And it rose out of a need to uh, write manuscripts broadly in the open in a massively collaborative way. So I'll give an example of that where uh, we wrote a review manuscript and a had an open invitation for all authors who were interested or had expertise in the topic and wanted to support uh, collaborative authorship when we do not know contributors in advance and uh, decided to take an open source software development mindset to uh, the academic writing process. So ManuBot supports manuscripts that are written in Markdown. Uh, so Markdown was a good trade-off between uh, very simple text that makes it easy to compare and track changes, uh, but also provide rich formatting. And the ManuBot system that's been developed in the back end can take the markdown and uh, do a fair amount of processing on that. One of the main features has been reference management, so we can have a simple citation and uh, ManuBot will process the markdown, generate references, and one of the big best features that's uh, unique to the system is it can automatically go out to uh, different APIs and use standard identifiers like DOIs, archive identifiers, PubMed IDs, or even URLs to go from the simple citations you see at the top of the screen, which are embedded in the markdown, then extract the metadata, uh, the reference information, and render them as inline citations in a manuscript and also build reference lists. This also simplified the process and we have many tens of authors that everyone's looking at essentially the same versions of references and don't have to track this information locally because it's all going to be managed just using external information about these references. So the workflow is essentially that uh, we've been using GitHub as the, the main source of the markdown files and everything else that uh, completes the manuscript. So to make edits, anyone, whether it's an existing contributor or a new contributor, can uh, edit markdown files through the GitHub web browser or locally if they want to clone the repository, then uh, can essentially push those changes back to GitHub. And the ManuBot system is using continuous integration ideas to always build the latest version of the manuscript. This is going out, extracting uh, the reference metadata, sometimes doing local analysis so that we can dynamically update the manuscript say pull in uh, recent statistics, use templating to uh, update, in this case, things like author counts, word counts, uh, get the latest versions of figures from various sources. And this brings all the benefits of continuous integration where uh, we can build test cases essentially so that the manuscript uh, will not build successfully if say references aren't provided correctly or if there's other mistakes. So we can ensure manuscript integrity as we're reviewing emerging and changes from external authors and contributors. Then the continuous integration is also going to automatically deploy manuscripts. So we'll build these as, by default, HTML and PDF versions that so we can support uh, anything that uh, Pandoc is able to support because that's the engine behind this. And I'll show you what that looks like as a final product, but essentially it means that we always have a version, uh, HTML version of the manuscript that's sitting out and continuously and publicly updated showing the latest version, a snapshot of the, the manuscript. Uh, there's also some kind of neat versioning and timestamping that's done on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is uh, not going to be something I talk about today. But the great thing and what uh, made this work for one of our largest scale manuscripts to date uh, was that we can use the software development ideas to support a very large number of contributors. So here we're seeing some pull requests made out at GitHub coming from a large number of contributors on this review manuscript where anyone in the world can open a pull request. We have project maintainers who review uh, changes to the text, changes to the references. It can provide feedback so that we have this collaborative process 
where anyone has permission to open a pull request, but the project maintainers have the authority to decide what gets merged in to maintain and a consistent flow and uh, stay true to the, the overall flow of the manuscript and the tone. Uh, so we have some stats at the end I won't show you, but this was a massively successful project. We had uh, up to 46 contributors all participate at various levels to help uh, write this manuscript over the course of a year, and it's been picked up in other collaborative projects as well. Uh, so I'll flip over and show you what this looks like, but I'll just note that in the slides that are linked in the Etherpad agenda, uh, there's some more technical details about how this works in the back end. Uh, the Manubot's a Python package. It's open source under the BSD3 license, and there's also essentially template manuscripts that uh, we call a Manubot rootstock, so this would be the starting point where we have a bare bones repository that somebody can clone and then set up to get started with this process, building their own manuscript. Uh, we're using the Manubot system to write about the Manubot system. So this is what it looks like. We have an HTML version. This is hosted using GitHub pages. It's always versioned. We can go back to the commit that corresponds to this version of the manuscript. So it's all in HTML. Uh, we have some dynamically updated information here. So we're actually pulling some statistics from code that's being run in the same GitHub repository. And then we have a snapshot of the GitHub repository at this particular uh, commit. And uh, essentially all the files and content, the markdown files, images, and so forth are in this GitHub repository. So again, the main features were uh, supporting this massively collaborative system where everything's written in the open and we can use Manabot to manage this uh, widespread writing process. So right. I'll cut it there and take any questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, um, so we have one question in the, on the agenda here. Uh, how is author contribution or credit defined between those uh, 43 authors on uh, collaborating on the work? Yeah, so that's, I'm glad that came up. So one of the great features about this is because we're tracking everything at a very fine resolution with Git commits, we've done a lot of analysis about uh, actually everybody's contribution on that system. So here we have some kind of post-publishing analysis on the uh, authors where we see essentially characters contributed by each of the authors over the span of months that's all just been analyzed from the, the Git log. So we can get raw stats on who contributed what pieces and then uh, the authors in total can make decisions about how they want to uh, you know, assign authorship and what contribution means to a project like this. In this review, we, uh, we happen to have so many authors that we essentially had different categories that generalized the, uh, the typical co-first author uh, annotations you might see in smaller manuscripts and then did some automated random assignments to get a final author order of this. Thank you very much. Right, I'll yeah. watch the agenda if there's other questions. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll probably need to uh, bring the call to two minutes, three minutes, uh, to an end, uh, unless um, the next person, so that would be um, Lorraine uh, Grunfeller, uh, would you be able to run your presentation very quickly? But I'm afraid we won't have to, we won't have the time for questions after that anymore. Yes, sure, I can. That? Yes, 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 I can do it in three three minutes. Can you hear okay. me? Okay, excellent. Well, um, I wanted only today to update you about the opening of the Software Heritage Archive. Last call, I was describing a bit of the project. Uh, Software Heritage uh, has the mission of collecting, preserving, and sharing all the software source code. So um, now, uh, if you can see my screen, uh, I wanted to do a, a really short demo of how you can browse the archive. So you can search with a URL, um, with a part part of the URL or the entire URL. Uh, I hope that in the next few months we can add more features uh, for searches on the archive. And then you can browse the um, the software source code that was crawled and integrated in our um, archive. So as you can see now, I'm on the Apollo 11 uh, project, which uh, was originated from GitHub. Um, you can go to the visits, like in um, the Internet Archive, 
can see different visits and you can go to another visit and see the um, data that was collected. Uh, something very nice here uh, that we added and that we uh, really um, want you to use is our permalinks, which are the um, software identifiers that we can give you to the content, the directories, the revision, and the entire snapshot that was taken in the visit. So here, you, when you click on the permalinks uh, tab on the right, uh, you have the different possibilities that you can copy and share with your um, with your research, and and then you can uh, you can um, use it as a reference in your citation. Um, I will end it here, even though I wanted to show you also how you can deposit software on the HAL Inria um, platform. Um, all software that is deposited in Alinria can be um, uh, will be archived in software heritage uh, which is great um, I will uh, stay here and 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 thank you right excellent uh, so uh, as it says on the slide uh, please do put your questions uh, for Moraine uh, on the agenda if you have any questions. Uh, I'm terribly sorry we weren't able to, to share this, uh, to share Moraine's screen, uh, but I hope you all had the link to be able to follow her presentation. Uh, and now uh, we have to draw the, uh, our meeting to a close. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, and thanks uh, thanks very much to all the uh, presenters for, uh, for sharing their updates. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry for anyone who uh, was hoping or expecting to share their update today uh, that have put themselves farther down uh, alongside the agenda. Uh, we are hoping to have another call of this kind in October, so I'm hoping that um, you may still be keen to, to share your updates then. And in the meantime, um, I hope others will, will be able to comment uh, on, on this document that we, that we have today um, or, or ask you questions as well. Uh, now, um, we'll, uh, I, just to make sure you know, uh, we will publish the summary of this uh, call very soon uh, and we'll also make the recording of the call available. Uh, feel free to keep up the discussion on Twitter uh, and uh, also uh, uh, do follow um, Eleve Innovation uh, on Twitter and, uh, and, and if you haven't yet, uh, please consider uh, signing up for our technology newsletter, um, which will be um, a source of, of the information about the next call as well as other things uh, that we put in it. So thank you very much again uh, and um, I would really appreciate if you took the, the, the three minutes time or even less that it will take to fill in the um, exit, um, exit survey uh, when you will be switching your go to meeting off. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>